Right, so on Friday, we just finished up with mitosis, our pictures, and we drew off foot phase, foot phase, hand phase, telo phase. Right alongside of telo phase is this process called cytokinesis. And cytokinesis is really dealing with the division of the rest of the cell, and I'm going to just call that the cytoplasm. So the cytosol plus everything else that's inside of the cell. And really it occurs simultaneously alongside telophase. So if we were to draw out cytokinesis, we should also include the uh, telophase. And the big thing of cytokinesis, and this is our reforming nuclear envelope here with our genetic material inside. So that's telophase. And with cytokinesis in mammalian cells or animal cells, we begin to go through uh, this thing called the, uh, the cleavage fur. So basically, it's just like drawing a string on a stuff sack uh, for a sleeping bag, we basically have motor proteins that begin to pinch off the, uh, the cell membrane, the plasma membrane. And as that happens, we just have this random distribution of the cytosol and everything else, mitochondrial and complex, that gets pushed into the two new cells. So once the cell has fully separated, there is going to be some regeneration that has to occur. In G1, as we move back to the interface, that G1 phase, we're going to have growth that occurs. And part of that growth is to put in new mitochondria and to rebuild the Golgi complex to make sure that all of those organelles are fully uh, formed and fully available for the new cell that's been formed. In a plant cell, remember plant cells are eukaryotic cells, but they have the cell wall, and then they also have the cell membrane. So as they go through division, we actually begin to lay down cellulose in the middle of the cell. And that cellulose is going to reform the cell wall. The, uh, the, the membrane is going to pinch off to form two new cells in here as well. So it's a little bit different because of the so wall, but very much the same cytokinesis, uh, regardless of animal versus plant cell. All right, so I've shown you mitosis in pictures. I want to give you a little bit more syntax uh, on what's actually going on biologically and chemically in each step along the way from prophase to telophase. So one of the things that has to happen in mitosis, in addition to the chromosomes condensing into the chromosome structures, we've got to begin to build this thing called the mitotic spindle. So we go through this process of forming the mitotic spindle. This is really happening from prophase into metaphase. And the way that we're building this mitotic spindle, these are basically going to be reorganization of the uh, fibrous proteins that make up the cytoskeleton. So we're going to go through this process to partially disassemble the cytoskeleton. Prophase to metaphase. And in the process of disassembling, you basically get the raw materials, the raw proteins, to then reorganize to form the mitotic spindle. The mitotic spindle is made up of uh, proteinaceous filaments called microtubules. And they begin to extend or protrude, or give, are given the appearance of protrusion from this part of the cell 
that contains the centrioles called the centrosome. So the centrosome is just kind of this location. And you can see that here. We begin to generate these regions that are going to have protruding microtubules forming the, the uh, mitotic spindle. And that centrosome, just so that we're all clear, just give a definition here. It's just simply the location in the cell where the mitotic spindles form. And as the mitotic spindle begins to form, they're typically forming around, or oftentimes they're forming around this organelle called the centrioles. And so as the centrioles gain the mitotic spindle, they begin to form this thing called the aster. And it's just because it looks similar to a star or an asteroid. So they call it the aster, same uh, Latin derivative for both words, aster and asteroid. Uh, and, and it's just a reference to the centriole kind of located in the middle and then moving away or coming out of the, the centrioles, you have the spindle fibers that are beginning. So it looks like a star that's, that's growing or glowing. Now, originally these centrosomes begin to form basically in the same part of the cell, but then they begin to move. They begin to translocate to what will become the poles of the cell, which are the opposite, opposite portions of the cell that's getting ready to go through mitotic division. So the centrosomes organize at opposite ends of the cells. And once they arrive at those opposite ends of the cell, like you can see here in this figure, they're at the poles, and so now we refer to them as the spindle poles. Okay, so the spindle poles are beginning to form. At the same time, you have the chromatin network, that structure of chromosome, condensing to form our chromatids. So those chromatids begin to form, they begin to condense out of the chromatin network, and they get pulled together by this protonaceous structure. Anyone remember what that was called? It's part of the, it's part of the centromere. Chromatids have protein structure. Part of the centromere was called the kinetochore. So these kinetochores are formed, and it's called a kinetochore because it contains a motor protein, which is a protein that just has the ability to move. And it's going to be the kinetochore and these motor proteins that interact with the spindle fibers. And that motor protein is going to use that spindle fiber as basically a conduit for it to begin to walk the chromatid towards the opposite ends of the pole. So we attach those to the spindle fibers. Now, the kinetochore is first going to move the sister chromatid into the metaphase plane. So you can see that kinetochore here, or kinetochore, I should say, here, uh, part of the centromere. And as the nucleus disintegrates and we get our mitotic spindles, those motor proteins begin to line up 
the chromatid on that metaphase plate, on that center portion of, of the cell. So we're going to line those chromosomes up. They're in metaphase. Again, that's called the metaphase plate. So through prophase and metaphase, all of this happens. Spindle fibers form, the kinetic core line up the sister chromatin on the middle, they uh, get attached up to these spindle fibers, and then we move into the second half of mitosis, anaphase and telophase, which is the nuclear division portion of mitosis. So anaphase to telophase. So during nuclear division, what ends up happening is, is, is these spindle fibers, they begin to break apart or disintegrate from one end. Spindle fibers begin to break apart from one end. And the reason they're breaking apart is because that <laughs> kinetic core has an enzyme that as it walks, the motor protein walk along the spindle fiber, that enzyme, it's a protease, meaning that it breaks down the protein. And so spindle fiber begins to break down as the chromatin is walked along that spindle fiber. So spindle fibers breaking apart the motor protein in the kinetic core. Walks the chromosomes. Along the spindle fibers moving towards the centrosome, towards the pole. Now this whole progression occurs until the chromosomes end up at the opposite poles. So through the anaphase into telophase, the chromosomes get walked along that mitotic spindle. End up at the opposite poles. And as they enter the opposite poles where the two new daughter cells are going to begin to form, those chromosomes get repackaged, resealed up into a nuclear envelope. I'm going to give you some more on cytokinesis. I've already kind of hit on it, but it'll be good for you to have since I've seen your notes. So cytokinesis, again, not technically part of my, uh, uh, mitosis, but occurs alongside of mitosis, alongside telomeres. And this is dealing with 
the separation of the cytoplasm leads to the two new daughter cells. So cytokinesis kinesis begins, then telophase. The cytoplasm. And I am using cytoplasm there very specifically because that's again the description of the cytosol the solution plus everything else. So, two ways this can happen in animal cells, or we could even step back and we could just call that cells, eukaryotic cells without a cell wall. And you begin to develop that thing called the cleavage furrow. And that cleavage furrow is going to be created through the actions of two proteins. And these are two proteins that you're going to see come up later on um, as you go through your biology education, in particular your muscle contraction. So these are proteins that allow for a change in size of a cell. And that's really what we're doing with the cleavage grow is we're reducing the size so much that we can split the membrane and split the cytoplasm. Those two proteins are going to be myto, uh, actin and myosin. So these actin and myosin proteins are going to form the structure, the proteinaceous structure, to create a contractile ring to develop to develop the uh, cleavage furrow. And really, the cleavage furrow is a lot like a drawstring, like what you find on a stuff sack or sleeping bag, as I previously mentioned. So I would have actin and myosin proteins that are all lined up here along the cleavage furrow, and as they begin to contract, they allow separation of the membrane, basically squeeze off until it pinches and then separate. A little bit different in cells that have a cell wall. And I'll use an example of a plant cell. But we can think of this as just being cells with cell walls. So as we go through that process of dividing the cells, we're going to have material, vesicles from the Golgi complex. Going to move to the center of the cell. And those vesicles, they're not only going to carry, so as we separate the membrane, not only are they going to carry the lipids that are required to form the new membranes to help facilitate that, but also are going to allow material to be laid down to form the cell wall, the new cell wall. So we start out by forming this thing called the cell plate, and it eventually becomes the cell wall incorporated into the cell wall as more material is deposited. Now once you have all of this, I have a couple of videos because this is a I'm basically giving you static syntax to describe a dynamic process. And so I want to actually show you a couple of videos that will illustrate what the process actually looks like of going through and causing a cell to undergo mitosis. Deposited. <laughs> 
Does everybody have what they need? So this first video just shows animal cell division. And so you're just going to see one, one cell forming here. Or one cell dividing into two new cells. Maybe. Make sure we start that over. Everybody see it? So there's your cell, and you can actually see the big nucleus here, and then this is the rest of the cell up here. So the nucleus breaks up, and we're beginning to condense our chromosomes so we can see them even better. What would be next? We're going to form the... Anyone? You're about to be told, metaphase plate. And now the cells are pulled in opposite directions, and really it's because they're they're walking along those mitotic spindles. And then they begin to collapse back into the new daughter nucleus, and then there is cleavage furrow and cyto cytokinesis. All right, the, the second video here. So that was a, a differential phase contrast microscopy video. The second video, um, it's a breast cancer model, and they're going to show division in these breast cancer ca these breast cancer cells, and they take the the dividing um, chromosomes with fluorescence, and so you'll see them kind of light up as they go through division. Well, so Olivia said up here it happened so fast. If you take a look up here, this is seconds. Uh, and so there's 60 seconds in an hour, or in a minute, I mean, and then uh, 360 seconds in an hour. And we're going through basically about 1,000 seconds in a second. So it's, it's actually not that fast in real time. And in fact, it might even be 10,000 seconds in a second. If you watch it again. Well, cancer cells are going to have oncogenes present in the genome, which are genes with mutations that usually disrupt cell cycle. And they do go faster, and that's why you get, it, it's basically unregulated cellular growth. Because normally for every cell that, if, if, you know, if you're an adult and you're no longer really growing, every cell that grows, it should probably be uh, coupled to a cell that's lost. Uh, and so we have, thanks. So we have the, the stages of the cell cycle, but then we also have these other processes called programmed cell death. Apoptosis is called cell suicide. And when the cell gets old and it's no longer needed or it's no longer functioning well, it'll go through this process where it basically packs itself up and breaks itself apart so that it can be recycled and re, re, uh, regenerated into a new fresh cell through the cell cycle. Uh, in cancer cells that develop a tumor, you have reductions in apoptotic pathways and less restriction on cell cycle progression. So the cell cycle progresses without a lot of the controls that normally are in place, which we're going to talk about here shortly. 
and then you don't lose the cells uh, at the same rate through the apoptotic pathway. And so cells keep forming the tumor. And you end up getting additional vasculature that makes its way into the tumor to help supply this increase in metabolic demand. And then parts of the genome and the cells, onco on oncotic cells, will begin to break off. And then you have metastasizing cells moving through the bloodstream or through the lymphatic system, and they can go to other places and create um, the same mutational issues in those other cells. That's like the, the most like probably inaccurate basic description of cancer ever given on the planet because it's a really serious disease. But basically, it comes down to unregulated cell growth to develop the tumors, and it's because of the mutations that occur in the genome of specific cells that that's a lot to happen. And so, all right, so we are going to talk about regulating the cell cycle. Before we do that, we haven't talked anything about bacteria. And bacteria don't undergo mitosis. And that really should surprise us because even though we have a genetic material in our bacterial cells are not contained in a nucleus. So we don't have to break the nucleus apart and we can split it up. So bacteria actually use a slightly different process. And that process is shown here and it's called fission, bacterial fission. So we're going to divide the cell and divide the genetic material in this process called binary fission. Now the prokaryotic chromosome, it's going to be in this thing called a, a, a plasmid. And that's a circular DNA molecule rather than linear DNA molecules if we have in eukaryotic cells. So if the DNA is contained in this circular molecule, in animals it's linear, except for in the mitochondria. We do have a mitochondrial genome, and it's actually very similar to what we find here in the bacterial genome. It's a circular plasmid type structure. And this plasmid is typically affixed. It's not shown here very well, but it's typically affixed to part of the plasma membrane. So we got this bacterial cell and the circular well, there would eventually be a, another end. You get this attachment of the plasmid to the plasma membrane. It's still going to go under duplication. At the end of duplication, you'll have the original plasmid and then a copy of the plasmid. So that here red. And it will also be attached. Um, I actually can draw that very well. Let me draw it over here. Attachment is normally on the opposite side. So cell membrane on the opposite side. Attach our plasmids on opposite sides of the cell after we've gone through a duplication process. And then the cell is going to begin to grow lengthwise. 
goes lengthwise, we're actually going to synthesize additional plasma membrane, and if the cell wall is present, we'll add additional cell wall as well. And as it goes through this elongation process, the plasmids get pulled in opposite directions, and eventually will undergo something analogous to or similar to um, the development of the cleavage furrow, but the end result is to eventually have the membranes or the membrane divide into two cells. So very simple, simple process compared to the process that we have in eukaryotic mitosis in the cells. Everybody got everything they need? What I want to do now is begin to talk about the regulation of the cell cycle itself. So you're all familiar with the cell cycle, and hopefully you can now repeat it. That we start out with G1, go through the S and G2, which is called interphase, then we move into mitosis and cytokinesis to go through the actual division of the cell and get our two daughter cells. During the G phases, in particular, G1, we're really collecting raw resources because we're about to go into S phase to duplicate the DNA. We probably don't want to start that process until I have adequate resources available. So we're going to have a regulation system that's in place. And we're only going to proceed or progress through the cell cycle when certain conditions are met. Now, depending on the cell, this will determine how the cell progresses through the cell cycle. And what I mean is that some cells turn over frequently. Well, other cells, they may only progress through the cell cycle when they are needed. And so this may include, may include uh, after some sort of injury when we're trying to repair, those cells normally wouldn't go through the cell cycle and they begin to progress through the cell cycle because that tissue is needed to be repaired. And then there are some occasions where the cell doesn't progress at all, so not at all. Supposed to be at that side. Let's try that. So some do not progress at all. When they don't progress at all, that's known as quiescence. And you've maybe seen on other figures there's a little arrow that came off to a G0. Typically, when the cell is in quiescence, we say that it's in G0. It's just going through normal day to day cell, uh, cell life and not working towards progression. And when we need to repair from injury, so maybe you get a cut in your skin, normally. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, that's what I thought about. I know that one that gets Oh, no, frequently, um, cells that are undergoing spermatogenesis 
there's cells that are being replaced, it's still not being replaced by the ketosis. Um, there are uh, cells in the liver that constantly are turned over as they, as they um, are used. So there are basically three different options, and those three different options are going to be regulated or controlled at the molecular level. So those differences are going to be controlled at the molecular level. So what molecules are present that help to determine when resources are adequate to progress to the next stage of the cell cycle. So we have a series of chemical factors that are going to help in this progression process. And you can see some of them listed up here. Um, they are part of what's called the cell cycle control system. And we're going to end up seeing that we have to have these certain cellular factors or molecular factors rather chemical factors accumulate to a sufficient level in order for cell cycle to progress. So when they're low, we don't have cell cycle progression. As they elevate, we end up with progression of the cell cycle. Now, the cell cycle does progress at a given rate, but occasionally we're going to be stopped. So progression will be stopped at what's called a checkpoint. So we have this pause at certain areas along the way. And there's actually two different checkpoints that I want you to be familiar with. One happens during G1, it's called the restriction point. <coughs> and the other one happens at the end of G2 as we go into uh, mitosis. And so it's that transition point. So we call it the G2 after, uh, transition checkpoint. Now, what happens at the checkpoint is we're basically looking, in one sense, to see how many of these cell cycle proteins are present. If they're high enough, then we're going to progress to the next step. What controls the levels of these cell cycle control system proteins? Well, it's, it's going to honestly be external and internal factors. We have seen, I, I've actually shown that these CDK and CD kinase molecules, um, in particular CDK1, increases during starvation. So why would that be? Well, that's an external factor that may indicate that resources are not adequately available to support this energetically demanding process. So we want to prevent the organism from going through that process if the external environment isn't fully capable of supporting an, an individual, individual that's about to go through the cell cycle, which is going to increase energy. There's also internal uh, internal factors. Maybe we haven't collected up enough nucleotides. And so we have to continually collect up more nucleotides and raw materials so that when we get to synthesizing that DNA molecule, we can complete the whole task. So there's going to be those internal and external factors that are going to help to determine when these checkpoints have been met and we can lift that restriction to continue forward. So starting out with animal cells, 
what we find, and that's what I'm showing here, is we have two interacting sets of signals. And those two interacting step, uh, sets of signals, we have the cyclins, like G1 cyclin, and then we have the CDKs, which is the cyclin dependent kinases. Okay? If cyclin levels are low, then we have inactive cyclin dependent kinases. When cyclin levels are high, we end up activating our cyclin dependent kinases. It's a kinase, so what does it do? It phosphorylates something. What are we probably going to phosphorylate? We're probably going to phosphorylate some of the other um, checkpoint uh, cell cycle proteins. We may actually uh, phosphorylate some proteins that are going to aid in progressing through the cell cycle and accomplishing the tasks of the cell cycle. So we have the cyclins and the CDKs. And as their levels fluctuate in the cell, responding to those internal and external factors, we get to those checkpoints, like the restriction site, and we basically look at the signal, how much active CDK is present in the cell. And if it's really low, we end up checking at that restriction point and getting a stop signal. And that means the process is not complete. As those processes begin to complete, more of those CDKs are activated because of the pres higher presence of the cyclins. And eventually we're going to get to a point where we get a different signal at that, at that checkpoint. And it's called the go-ahead signal. Now, what really happens here is that stop signal is always on. It's kind of like a stoplight that always illuminates red, but then when we get the go-ahead signal, the green is so bright on that stoplight that you can no longer see the, the red signal from the stop from the stoplight. So it's still on, but it's overridden and you can't see it anymore. So the stop signal is always on. The go-ahead signal is what's turning on and off. And when it's on, it overrides the stop signal. And this causes the cell to go into the next step. So we're talking about the restriction point. We progress into synthesis. And hopefully we have enough ATP supply, enough glucose, enough uh, raw materials for um, building the deep DNA molecule and the nucleotides that we can actually accomplish the task when we move forward. Okay, so that G1 checkpoint, this is what we would call the most important checkpoint. Again, up on the figure and what I'm going to give you now is it's also called the restriction point. So at this G1 checkpoint or the restriction point, again, stop signal is always on. So if the stop signal is not being overshadowed, that stop signal at the restriction point, 100% of the time, we're going to see the cell does not divide, does not progress to go through division. In fact, that stop signal can be so uh, influential at that restriction point that the cell may actually enter to G0, which is a non-dividing state. Now, if we have accumulation of an active CDK cycling complex, 
and that's expressed at the restriction site, we get our go ahead signal. And really what happens here with the go ahead signal is I have more protein in raw quantity for the go ahead signal than the number of proteins that I have trying to establish the stop signal. And you have competition that occurs at that restriction site and because of the higher levels of those go-ahead signal proteins, we go ahead we move forward. When you have that go-ahead signal, the cell always continues through the cycle. And this is at the restriction point. So the G2M transition checkpoint is actually really going to be very much um, unable to stop. It may stall progression to accumulate enough product so that we can go through mitosis, but if we get past the restriction site, we are going to divide. If we don't get past the restriction site, we're going to move into that non dividing cell state called G0. That's us continue through the cycle. So the cell always continues through the cycle, meaning that cell division, once you get past the restriction site, cell division is going to happen. All right, so let's begin to put in these, all these proteins. And the way that we try to model this is a cell cycle clock. Now a clock can be used to set the pace of the day, hours, minutes, seconds. The cell cycle clock is going to set the rate of progression through the cycle. Center of the cycle. So we're going to have progression that's regulated by the molecule abundance, the molecular abundance, and the activity of two different types of proteins. And I've already mentioned them. These two types of proteins are going to be a group of protein kinases called the cyclin-dependent kinases, or just simply the CDKs for short. And then the cyclin itself. I'm going to go ahead and pick up there on um, 